Ladies and gentlemen, NSBA now brings you our feature presentation. You know, I, I don't know how many properties we own. Actually, I've never counted them. Back in our, our busy times, I would build about three new buildings a year. I use my truck as an office. A lot of times there's so many things happening during the day, if I don't write them down and prioritize them, they don't get done or they get missed. You know, I pride myself on returning phone calls, and if someone tells me to do something, I do do it. You know, I don't uh, cross anything off the list until it's done, whatever done means. got into drag racing in the mid-1960s. He built himself a race car. He was going faster than anyone else around. He was definitely one of the most prominent drag racers from this area, racing all over the West Coast. So this is a picture of the top fuel car that we went. 227 was our best mile an hour. This one, the funny car, we were 215, 218 back in the late 60s, early 70s. In the 60s sometimes, I built a Seagas Dragster, which was the very first car to go down SIR. That kind of got me, got the bug. Automobiles just represented freedom. And for whatever reason, you know, I picked up car magazines and they just had an appeal to me. I remember reading a magazine, and I still have it actually, and uh, it was a hot rod from the 1950s. And there was an article in there that uh, some engineer had suggested that it was impossible for an automobile to go 200 miles an hour in a quarter mile. And it was just one of those things that stuck in my mind and time went on and we said, hey, cars are able to go 200 miles an hour, let's try to do it. I think the first time I went 200 was right here. 200 miles an hour. My dad was from Hungary, came over here to Canada in 1939. And uh, that's where he met my mother, who is from Montreal. I was born in 42, brought up with my sister and myself. And, you know, we started with nothing, both my mom and dad, as well as when I went on my own. We never missed anything. We had what we had, and life was good. It was sort of something that my parents said, hey, you got to go to school, you got to get an education. And so not having any particular direction, I went to university and I had made the decision to go into education to be a school teacher because I was really motivated by getting two weeks off at Christmas, two weeks at Easter and summer holidays. Well, I lasted a year and a half and they thought that I should graduate early just because it wasn't my calling. At that time, I, uh, I actually started my business April 1st, 1964. Somehow I decided Midwest Automotive was a good name, so I did that. I remember phoning in Sastel saying I want a phone number for Midwest Automotive and she asked me, is it hyphenated or not? I never even thought about that. I said, yep, yep, it's hyphenated. So that's how it got to be hyphenated. He was the guy, if you wanted to go fast, you went into Midwest Automotive and you bought parts for your car, canceled the dream of speed. What got me involved in Saskatoon is I was in Winnipeg at a car show and a guy by the name of Brian Buchan had Softy Speed Shop. And he says, geez, you know, you should be trying to sell some parts in Saskatchewan. And he gave me some shifters and some miscellaneous parts and I brought them home in my 40 Ford Coupe and I sold them out of my dad's garage. And I didn't have two cents to rub together, literally, zero. Every penny I had was in my car. And until maybe 10 years, no, five years later, I found out my dad co-signed a loan that I borrowed $5,000 in the bank, and he actually put his house up as security for that loan. But he obviously had faith in me, and uh, he put a lot of time and energy into uh, our shop, just cleaning, fixing, being there. Then the parts business turned into the auto body business, turned into the muffler business, and by the mid-70s, I was kind of done with racing because I just didn't have enough hours in the day. So yeah, this is the location where our first shop was, the bulk cheese warehouse. I rented this building in 1964, and there's a little garage in the back here, and that was our first shop, and we sold automotive parts, speed parts. Business was a little bit slow, so Ken taught himself how to do auto body work, how to fix fenders, paint cars. He was painting Volkswagens for $29.95. And if the rear fenders were ripped, we would charge an extra $5. And the Volkswagen dealer just kept bringing us cars, and we kept painting them and helped pay the bills. We decided to buy a building in uh, 1966, actually, I guess it was. And uh, 
This particular building was uh, the Orange Crush Bottling Factory. It had been abandoned for quite a few years, and it was in total disarray. We ended up buying it at that time for $25,000. And my dad helped, and we rebuilt the building, and we rented apartments up here in Broadway. And uh, 66, 67, somewhere in there, we bought another apartment block on Main Street. And one of the fantasies was that you'd get a rent check in the mail every month, and uh, that's all there was to it. We got schooled pretty quick on that one. You know, buildings require a lot of maintenance. I think Ken's early struggles are still something that he remembers vividly. I believe it was December 21st, 1969, our biggest customer, Dominion Motors, Ford dealer in town went bankrupt. A friend of mine phoned me on a Sunday night to tell me to hear Dominion Motors went bankrupt and they were my biggest customer. Well, I was like, oh, that's a big problem. To make businesses successful is not easy. You have to do a lot of things well. There's no one singular path to success. So to do that, you have to be a hard worker. I started knocking on every door in town. I never ever thought we would fail. I just knew things would be difficult. But, you know, as time went on into January, uh, Ford Motor Credit stepped in and uh, their main man came to my shop one day and said, would you like to paint some cars? And they fed me cars for three years. And so that was the good news that we could survive that way. But obviously losing a big customer like that was a lesson learned. Beware of the friendly giant. They can kill you. Part of Ken's skill set is he is a man of action. And so when problems come up in his business, he does not procrastinate, he does not put them aside, he deals with them. So he quickly figured out in the auto body business, it was better to be the realtor than the guy who occupied the auto body shop. When everything started to speed up, the economy came back in the 70s, then I bought a piece of land out on 8th Street and we opened, which originally was Midwest Muffler, which currently now is OK Tire. And then life sort of took on a whole different slant where we started building buildings and leasing them and we just gradually transitioned from the automotive end of it to real estate and it just was a very slow, non-planned change in direction of the company. Making that transition is sometimes not easy and what's so difficult for a lot of people that was not difficult for Ken is they cannot abandon what brought them success. What got me into the construction business was I hired a fellow to build me a muffler shop on 8th Street and he mussed around with this building for about six months and he was so incompetent I fired him. At any rate, I went and finished the building in 30 days and I thought, isn't that tough? And I look back on it, I'm not even sure how all that stuff got fit into a normal day. It just took on its own life. Buildings are like cars, they wear out. Buildings have a lot more longevity, well maintained, but we've bought a lot of buildings in town here because they weren't maintained, they were just coming apart. The bones were good, but no uh, TLC given to them. One of the buildings that I think is the most symbolic of Ken's career is the CP station on the Idlewild Drive. It's a hundred year old heritage building that Ken restored in the 1990s, and Ken physically spent a lot of time on the job site. This building is 320 feet long. And I can't tell you how many times I lapped this building because I spent a year and a half here every day and then I would run to the office for a few minutes and then go back to the office at night. But this one, I did not have a site super and I was welded to this building. He's won multiple awards for building restoration and he makes sure that every aspect of the job is done absolutely as well as it can be done. It just seemed a natural fit and it was just falling into decay and we tried to buy it a few times and because it wasn't disposable real estate by the railway, it fell on deaf ears. And they put it up for sale, we put an offer in, we got it. But this one, we're proud of this building and the city should be. It's gonna be here for a long time to come. Four people who make Saskatoon a better place. You know, I was flattered to see that article and I guess it's just because I care about what I do and people notice it. Because I certainly don't go out looking for recognition. Oh, we did this, we did that. That's probably one of my biggest downfalls. I just go about doing my job. But people recognize it, and that's kind of flattering. Not Ken's the hardest working guy that pretty much anyone knows around here. This is Ken to a T, and it's not joking. People will say, Ken, when are you going to retire? And he'll go, well, I'm not retired, but I'm, I'll probably never retire, but I'm working half days. I only work 12 hours now. And it's the truth. 
He works all the time. Colleen, fortunately, is been drinking the Kool-Aid and she's worse than I am. I go to bed at 10 o'clock, she's up till two in the morning. A lot of people strive for work-life balance. Ken and Colleen do not have work-life balance. They have complete work-life integration. The business, Midwest, their personal life, they're one and the same. When I first met Ken, I had no intention of being involved in the company. I was doing television and I was practicing law, and one thing kind of led to another. I remember one night we had plans to go to the movies, and he was at the office, as he always was, and he was running late, so he said, just meet me at the office. So I went to the office to meet him, and I said, what's keeping you here tonight? And he said, Oh, he said, there's this lien on this building that I want to buy and we want to try to get it off and it's a problem and I've talked to some lawyers about it and it's this and it's that. And there was where I made, I don't know if it was a mistake or what, but that was a pivotal moment. I said to him, let me have a look at that because I wanted to go to the movies. And so I had a look at it and I said, oh, I, I think there's some ways to deal with this. Um, I'll, I'll, let's go to the movies and I'll look at it tomorrow. And I did and that was kind of the beginning. Honestly, since I met Colleen, you know, I guess I grew up. You know, I tell my kids, it took me to be about 50 before the light came on. I think that in a lot of cases, I probably uh, didn't spend as much time with my kids uh, as I should have, although they just came with me. So in other words, they were joining me, they would come to the job sites or come to the office, and that was our time together. And it wasn't planned or thought about or organized, it just happened, it just was. The work was part of our life, you know, and play. There was lots of play in there. And the stairs, the stairwells, and elevators. And we'll taper down over 20 feet. You know, I just feel like I just kind of do my own thing, my own way. Try not to upset too many people on the road. I think Ken was pretty hard on a lot of the guys that work for him in his early days. Once you put them into their job, whatever their position is, you find out really quickly if they're doers or talkers. And over the years, you just attract like-minded people and uh, they stay and we love them and uh, life is good. Hello. Morning, Ken. Hi. Going to be busy Saturday? Saturday, we got work for the whole day. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm not there, start without me. <laughs> hey, bye. Bye, bye. Don't ask anybody to do something you wouldn't do. You know, and that's just, that's sort of the way you lead by example. You know, like I'm the same as the guys that work for me. Because hey, they all work hard and they work hard for me and I really appreciate that. And uh, I want to reciprocate. Like our big motto in the property management deal is we're always open, even when we're not. And the reality is the phone rings, somebody's going to answer it, whether it's me or an answering service or whatever, but it's 24 seven. Not only do we take the calls, we deal with the complaints or we deal with the issues. And a lot of them I deal with personally and that's what gives us that little leg up. I don't know if a lot of our tenants know who Ken is, that he's the owner of the company, this company that owns all of the real estate, you know, large Saskatchewan operation. I don't know that they know the guy showing up with the plunger is the president, CEO and owner of the company. In my travels during the day, I'm driving all around town and if there's a service call and, and the girls phone me and say, you know, for example, there's a toilet plug somewhere, I keep a plunger in my truck and if I'm going by, I'll stop and fix it. It just takes me a few minutes as opposed to having my service guy jump in his truck, quit what he's doing, come over here and do it. Here's how Ken's day goes. He rolls out of bed, quick shower, 15 minutes later he's at his first stop, which is probably a job site. He'll be seeing how the construction guys are doing. You know, right now we're building a 55,000 foot office building in the north end. Ken is at the job site daily. So then now they're putting all the dirt in, compacting it, got our plumbing in, and uh, just trying to get the shell built up so we can close the building in, pour the floors. He's got so much expertise, he shares that expertise with them in a very short amount of time and then rushes back to the office. I am a manager of urgency. And, and that means uh, I hate procrastination. Now, when you get so many things on your list, you gotta just prioritize them. After 54 years in business, every day Ken still personally goes through every piece of mail that comes into the office. I asked Ken, why do you go through the mail every day? And he told me, that's how I know what's going on with my business. I've seen him sit down and literally, and we joke about this at the office, figure out in about 10 minutes, if that, that's long, would be long for him, on the back of a napkin over lunch, 
how to do some multi-million dollar deal where other people will be sitting with pens and papers and trying to figure this out for ages. And in the end, when they're smart people, they come to the same conclusion Ken came to. If you'd have asked Ken, even when he first got into real estate, do you see yourself doing real estate in the US? He probably would have gone, mm, I, I don't know, like, no. Like, it wasn't like a plan. He saw a need, he saw an opportunity. He started doing business in British Columbia when things here were slow. Saskatoon had about 80 or 85 building permits for homes. We built over 200 in Vancouver in that era. He didn't leave the province, but he did take the money and he started investing it elsewhere. And that's the thing about capital, it is mobile and you can do that with it. So now when we see opportunities in the US, we take them. And Vancouver was pretty good, so then I started going down to Seattle and uh, stumbled into a guy that we've been partners since 1989 actually, and we've built hundreds of units. And at the same time in Seattle, we were getting into a credit crunch and we had a need for capital, so it was an easy thing to have happen. Doing business deals, the way I look at it, it's like finding a good date. I went and saw them three different occasions over a period of about a year, year and a half, and it wasn't until the third time he said, ah, come on, talk to me. I think it might have been the first deal he did with somebody out of town, and so he didn't have any paperwork to do, and actually, I think he sent a million dollars down on a handshake. Well, we did a project then in 89 or 90, and we've done millions of dollars worth of business since then. You know, I don't have a lot of experience in commercials, so when we've gotten into commercial projects, I've probably gone to him and asked some really stupid questions in his opinion, but I needed to do that, because I, you know, what would Ken do? That's, that would, and a lot of times on different things, I know what Ken would do, and I just do it. We were having a problem with a large project in Seattle, and I was in LA, and Larry phoned me and said, geez, I better talk to you. And I was struggling with how to tell him about this million dollar cost overrun we were going to have. And he says, well, land in Seattle, I'll pick you up and drive you up to Vancouver so I can catch my flight in Vancouver. And um, I told him, and there was a long period of silence in the car for a couple minutes. Most people would hide those kind of things, and it's just being straight up, telling you how it is. And that was really the last we talked about it. Thanks for telling me. Keep going. He's migrating from a contained geographic area to a broader geographic area. And again, he's taken what he's learned from here, taking that to other places. But he also recognizes, as he looks for businesses and real estate in new locations, that the real estate environment in Phoenix is not the same as Saskatoon. What's the difference? What can you take? What's, what's unique that you have to be cautious and thoughtful about? And how are you going to figure out how to take all of that in consideration? And for whatever reasons, we've never gone to Regina. We've looked at Winnipeg. We haven't gone to Eastern Canada. Uh, we have done stuff in Fort McMurray. I, I know our thrust just seems to be in uh, southwestern U.S. We have a lot of connections there, and especially a lot of friends and connections through racing. So it just seemed like a natural fit. The difference between Canadian and U.S. law in terms of legal and accounting is totally different. And we're very fortunate that Colleen is more versed in both of those fields than anybody we deal with. It's just been out of necessity. The fact that I'm with Ken all the time and I know from a practical standpoint what the needs of the deal are, it's just great to have that continuity of somebody always being there. And with me, I, I, I can't quit, so <laughs> I'm gonna be there for always. Well, the Meridian started uh, it was kind of an interesting story because Carl Miller worked for me as a laborer when he was going through, I think it was high school, maybe even in university for a while. And one day he came to me and said, hey, there's a piece of property I'd like to buy. And I went and looked at it and I don't have the money. And I said, well, we should buy all three of these and build uh, an apartment, a condo. Agreed, we started a little company up and agreed to do it. And uh, it turned out successful. So I didn't have the time or energy to get involved in another construction company, so Colleen and Carl formed a legitimate partnership in Meridian. And I'm kind of the guy in the background. But the big deal is we made the decision, probably wrongly so, to build the Lux uh, High Rise on Broadway and the King George simultaneously. And the market really took a dive. I don't say I was nervous, but we had multi, multi millions of dollars out but I never really was concerned about it because I just know these guys work hard and the projects were neat and they would come out, and they did. 
And I just had the faith in Carl and Colleen to work hard, make them unique, different than anything else in the market. And to both their credits, those projects are here. What's interesting about Ken and Colleen as business partners is they tend to have a very tiny space of overlap. The skills that Colleen has are almost totally unique from the skills that Ken has. This is a great way to propel a business. It's what's needed. It's kind of diversity in the making, but it's not easy to make work. She's different. I mean, we, we certainly have our disagreements, believe me, and uh, most of the time when I'm right, I find out I'm wrong later, but uh, no, it's just, uh, you know, the, the, there's a story that says if two people agree on everything, one isn't necessary. He's a little more practical than I am about a lot of things. I'm a little more of a dreamer, so we probably don't overlap completely there, but I think we're probably good for each other there because he brings me a little more back to reality and I encourage him to dream a little bit more. The biggest thing with hard work is that you got to want to. He gets more done in a day than anybody that I have ever seen. And one of the things that I always do is I always do the most difficult task first because from there on it's downhill. It's easier to do. He wants everything he does to be something that he can be proud of when it's finished and something that he can be proud of years and years down the road. I get involved completely in everything we do. I know most of the problems and how things should or shouldn't be built, and I got a visual mental picture of our buildings. I've been involved in them right from day one. I can solve a lot of the problems just by memory of, all oh, this could be what's wrong, and check this or check that. He'll tell you, in such and such a building, down in the basement, in the box, in the corner, you go find that piece. And you go there, and sure enough, it's there. So he's got a good memory. My wife won't agree with that, but <laughs> it's selective. Yeah, it's it's selective. selective memory. The good news is they come to me and ask me to help solve these problems. The bad news is they come to me and ask me to help solve these problems. So I've kind of created my own monster in a lot of ways. I wish he would delegate some things more than he does maybe sweeping up once in a while, he could delegate a little more often. But as I've gotten over many years to know Ken better, I think he, he gets something out of that. It's the yin and the yang of Ken. In your mind, what do you think is your biggest success? Oh. <laughs> the, the, the biggest success that I've had uh, is more happenstance, and it was the easiest thing I probably ever did. And I can't believe that that gets that hard to spit out. But it was being a single parent with three kids. Turned out well, uh, worked well. Uh, the kids and I brought each other up. And uh, it just, uh, yeah, you know, when I say that. Uh, I'm the most like, unlikely guy to become successful in business, for sure. And out of 100 guys that would be uh, successful as a single parent, I'd be the 100th. I asked my kids when they were out of high school, Do you, have you got any interest in our business? And they all said no. no. That's not true. My son said no. My daughter was sort of the one that would be I'll say the heir apparent. She was worked in the muffler shops, she worked in the office, she uh, had all of the skills to run a company. The deal that I made with her was uh, you have to go to university, get your degree, you have to go work in an accounting firm for five years, and then you come and see me. And uh, unfortunately what happened was is that uh, right at the fifth year she got cancer and uh, went through chemo three times and passed away at uh, 29. So the best laid plans of mice and men change. Colleen came into our life uh, much later, and she has become the person, along with Trevor, that would be the people running the company when I'm not here. So it's just all these plans were never intended to turn out this way, but in fact, uh, out of bad situations, they've turned out very well. Back about five years ago, uh, we were in a race, friend of mine's race car trailer in Bakersfield, California, and uh, he rolled out a tape measure, and at the time he said, how old are you? And I said, oh, I'm 72, I believe. So he puts his finger on the tape at 72, and he says, there's one, 72. 
and he stretched it out to 79, and he said the average Canadian male lives till 79. It was just a very poignant reminder of life. Now the good news is he phoned me up a year later to tell me the average male's life expectancy has increased to 86. There are not a lot of people in Saskatoon or even in North America that have run their own company continuously for over 50 years. They've grown it to the point that Ken's grown it. I think he deserves a lot of credit because Midwest is a very, very successful Saskatchewan success story. His degree of accuracy is unbelievable. I thought this guy is like an untapped source of ability. I just know what my abilities are. Uh, I can't build the Empire State Building. I can't. Not that's, true. That's not what I do. I just can't do it. And I'm not uh, going to put myself in a position that I know I wouldn't succeed. He might say he can't do it. What he means, I've learned the translation of that from Ken Talk. That means I don't want to do it. He absolutely could build the Empire State Building. Well, two or three things you can do that are really bad in business, okay? Make a decision out of fear. Make a decision because of dollars and cents. Or make an emotional decision. Having a private jet for himself for the company is something that was on Ken's bucket list for a long time, but he had a hard time rationalizing it. Ken is, uh, he is frugal. But even with the airplane, it was a business case that allowed him to buy the plane. Now our business is set up that we can be anywhere in the United States within you know, two to three hours. We just get on the plane and we go. So we can go down and look at opportunities and, and kind of pounce on them quickly. Being an entrepreneur was certainly not my uh, goal. It was to do what I like doing, and that was the automotive things, the cars. Cars were my ticket to freedom. Just one thing led to another, and there was interest in all these things, and I was reasonably good at it. It's the same with racing. It's just something I wanted to do. I like to do it. It's a lot of hard work, but it was just fun and I wanted to do it. Ken won't slow down. I think for Ken to slow down would be harder on him physically and mentally than it would be to keep going and going, I'm just trying to get a little more balance. And I'm encouraging him, Ken, you've kind of accomplished this all your life. Sit back and enjoy it. You uh, won't feel bad for it. The projects that he has are an accumulation of the last 50 years. They're not something that happened magically overnight. He's one of those entrepreneurs that truly made something out of nothing. I don't think Ken is aware of the positive impact that him just being Ken and his authenticity has on his business and on people. I spend a lot of time with Ken and I heard at the end of every day think, hey, I learned something today that I didn't know. He knows so much about everything. He's got to get so sick of me asking questions. The advantage is that I got 55 years of mistakes prior. I kind of look at every day like, uh, hey, i got to go to work today because there's more to do out there. You need uh, an adventure every day. It could be taking your wife to the coffee shop. It could be going for an oil change. It could be going for a walk in the park. You need an adventure, and that's really key. You need adventures, you need heroes, you need goals, and, and they don't have to be great, uh, huge goals. They just, it's like the longest journey, take them by the first step. If you had asked me 50 years ago, where do you see yourself in 50 years, I can guarantee it wouldn't be here. If we're traveling and it's not for business, which is rare, he gets bored so fast. We were on a trip to Hawaii and this was not business, this was pleasure. And we arrived in the afternoon and I said, oh, let's go for a walk from the hotel and walk down the beach and then come up through this shopping mall. Bad word to say to Ken, shopping. Next thing I know he's huffing and puffing and I thought, what's, what's the matter with him? And he goes, this is ridiculous. What do we come away here to do this for? He wasn't out of breath, he was just steaming. He was mad because there was nothing to do. So guess what I did? 
I got out the, the book in the room and looked up realtors and started phoning realtors. What can you take us and show us that you've got for sale for real estate? And that's how we stayed amused for a week in Hawaii.